Today's story is about a man called Retanu, his wife whose name is Kadamba and her lover whose name is Gopichand. Well, actually, no, at the time that my story begins, they're not yet lovers. They'd like to be, but they haven't managed to do anything yet because the husband, Retanu, is a very possessive man and he won't let his wife out of sight for long enough for her to do anything. And so Kadamba and Gopichand have flirted, they've talked about it, they would like to be lovers, but at this point, nothing has happened. And Gopichand, who's finally tired of waiting now, decides to take things into his own hands. He decides to make some plans. So that evening, he goes to Retanu and he says to him, he says, you know, I have learned how to extract the spirit out of someone's body and put it into a different body. And if you want to see how it's done, meet me tonight at exactly midnight, at exactly 12 o'clock at night, in the middle of the cremation ground, and I will reveal everything. Now, Retanu is fascinated. I guess I would be too, frankly, if someone said they could show me how to do this. Retanu is fascinated and so that night at exactly midnight, just like he's been told, he arrives in the cremation ground to find Gopichan standing there in the midst of all of those ashes, waving his arms around, doing all of these rituals, chanting mantras. And before anyone knows what's happening, the spirits from both the men's bodies, from both Gopichan and Retanu's body, the spirits from both the men's bodies rise out of the body and start to float in the air above. And poor Retanu, poor petrified Retanu, looks down to find himself staring at his own dead body below. Well, obviously, if the spirit has come out of the body, then the body is going to be lifeless. So he's floating around now in the air, looking down at his own dead body. And can you imagine how frightening that must be? I mean, I would be petrified. You're in the middle of the night, in the middle of a cremation ground. You're nothing but a little puff of air suddenly and you're looking down at your own dead body. Retanu is petrified but before he can actually say anything, Gopichand jumps into Retanu's body and he runs out of the cremation ground. Now poor Retanu, he has no idea what to do. If he was scared before, now he is absolutely mindless with fear because not only is he this little puff of air floating around in the middle of the cremation ground, but even his body has disappeared. And so he does the only thing that's left for him to do. He jumps into Gopichan's body and he too runs out of the cremation ground. Okay, scene two. Now all our three characters are on the move. And where are they going? Well, Gopichand in Retanu's body has, and I'm sure you've guessed, he has headed straight to Retanu's house so that now he can spend the night with Kadamba. They've waited so long to do this and now finally he's going to arrive there in Retanu's body. Nobody's going to blink an eyelid and as far as he's concerned, he's left Retanu floating around in the cremation ground. They're perfectly safe. They have the whole night to themselves. And so he is on his way to Retanu's house. Retanu in Gopichan's body has headed off to Gopichan's house because he has no idea where this man has gotten to with his body, but he does know that eventually he'll have to come back to his own house. So it'll be the best place to wait for him. So Retanu is heading off to Gopichan's house. And Kadamba, meanwhile, has also headed off to Gopichan's house because Finally, her husband is not around. She has no idea where he is, but who cares? He's not over there watching her like a hawk. This is the perfect time for her to be with her lover, to finally spend the night with Gopichan. So she too has headed off to Gopichan's house. And hence, when Retanu arrives at Gopichan's house in Gopichan's body, He's extremely surprised to find his wife waiting over there. But he's even more surprised when his wife, Kadamba, flings her arms around his neck and says, Darling, you finally arrived. I'm so happy to see you. My stupid husband has gone missing. I don't know where he is, but let's not think any more about him. This is our night together. And it is at this point that poor Retanu realizes exactly what is going on, what all this drama, what all this plan to leave him in the cremation ground was all about. But unfortunately, he cannot resist himself. He cannot control his lust, his passion, because for the last few weeks, Kadamba has been a little bit distant. And now that she's flinging her arms around his neck and inviting him into her bed, well, 
he finds that he cannot actually say no to her. And so he puts his arms around her as well, and the two of them go off to spend a night of love together. Scene three. It's now early morning. Gopi Chand, who has been waiting all night at Retanu's house for Kadamba to show up, is completely fed up. He's really irritated because what a waste of a night. What a waste of time. What a waste of energy, pulling all those spirits out of the bodies and exchanging bodies. It wasn't easy to do. All night long, he's waited for her. God knows where she is, but he's had enough. And so he decides to go back to his own house. And on arrival, of course, he finds Retanu and Kadamba lying in each other's arms in his bed. Now, when he gets there, to cut a long story short, a huge fight follows. The spirits are exchanged back into the correct bodies and a very angry Retanu grabs Kadamba in one hand, Gopichand with the other, and he drags them off to the king's court where he insists that the two of them should be punished. The king, when he hears the story, is very confused. Well, it's a confusing story. Your Majesty, punish this man, Gopichand. He ran away with my body. Oh, is that not your body that you're in now? No, no, this is my body, but he ran away with my body because he wanted to make love to my wife. Oh, did he make love to your wife? No, no, I made love to my wife, but I know what they were trying to do because she flung her arms around his neck and told him so. Oh, did she put her arms around his neck? No, 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 she put her arms around my neck. But <laughs> as you can see, it was a very confusing story and the king truly was very confused. But the point is, what happens now? Does the king ever figure out what the story was about? Does anybody ever get punished for their crime? And most importantly, what is the lesson from this story? So, the king goes off for a roundtable conference with his wife and his three daughters and they're the ones who actually explain the story to him so that he's not confused anymore. And it is also the queen who explains to him that nobody needs to be punished for what has happened over here because no crime has actually been committed. Gopichand had had bad intentions. He'd wanted to do something wrong, but destiny stepped in and stopped him from doing anything. You cannot punish somebody for merely thinking bad thoughts. He didn't commit a crime. Kadamba too had had bad intentions, but once again, destiny had stepped in and everything that she did, she actually did with the knowledge and the permission of her husband. Retanu knew exactly what was going on when he allowed her to take him to her bed. And so if her husband has chosen to agree to whatever she has done, society has no place telling her that she's in the wrong. So she too has not committed any crime. And of course, there was Retanu who had committed no crime at all, but according to the queen, he was the worst one of all because he had knowingly allowed his wife to dishonor herself, all because he had no self-control. He could not control his own lust, his own passions. And so he had allowed her to dishonor herself. And so he deserved no sympathy and actually nobody had committed a crime. And so no one deserved to be punished for this. And now you're wondering, what is the lesson from this really weird story? It's all about self-control. Self-control, self-discipline, willpower, whatever you want to call it. It is one of the most important things in our life. You know, we are told that to have a successful life or to have a life with positive outcomes, you need two things a high level of intelligence and a high level of self-control. Now, intelligence is not something that you can measure because you can't really define intelligence, but self-control, self-discipline, willpower, that is definitely within our power to develop. Unfortunately, however, I've noticed that these days self-control is not seen as a cool thing. You know, I find that if I ever ask people what is the strength in their character, they'll tell me that they're compassionate or they can multitask or they're really good at sport. Nobody ever says that they have a really high degree of self-control. But if you ask people about their weaknesses, it's the very first thing that they will list. I have no self-control when it comes to dessert. I have no self-control when it comes to gambling. I have no self-control when it comes to drink. And it's almost as though we make excuses for it because the moment you bring up the subject, somebody will say, oh, well, you know, you only live once or come on, you have to enjoy yourself sometimes. And oh, every now and then it doesn't matter. It's almost uncool 
to have self-control or to have willpower. Self-control, a high degree of self-discipline is the best thing that you can do for yourself. It's the best path to success. And now you're wondering why I told you this story as a lesson in self-control, because frankly, none of the three characters in this story are role models for self-control. Well, these stories were created as little reminders or like a little nudge to help you to remember your lesson because it was believed that if you tell a story that's too goody-goody, you know, if you tell a story about a person who has such a huge degree of self-control, they become too perfect and they become impossible to follow. They become impossible to emulate. And so the idea was to tell you a story that was funny enough to keep your attention and weird enough for you to remember always. And that's just how I want you to treat the story. So the next time you find yourself going down a path which you know you shouldn't, you find yourself letting go when you know that you should be controlling yourself, just remind yourself of the story. And that will remind you of the lesson and hopefully it'll be like a little shoulder to lean on for that next step that you have to take.